I want to welcome uh, all of you to, uh, to Chicago. I'm glad that we have some glorious weather for you. Uh, and on behalf of the University of Chicago, the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, the Department of Medicine, the Divinity School, uh, and our program on medicine and religion, I want to just say how pleased we are um, that all of you are here. Uh, my name is Dan Solmacy, and along with uh, Far Curlin, I'm the co-convener of this, uh, uh, this conference. Uh, we're glad we could fit it in between NATO and Memorial Day, and uh, <laughs> those are two big events. Um, uh, but mostly, uh, it's an opportunity, I think, for some serious um, academic uh, interfaith and interdisciplinary discourse um, at the intersection of medicine and religion. Um, and I don't know that there's another really serious uh, forum in which that occurs, and um, uh, this is the first of what we hope will be uh, many uh, such, uh, such conferences. Uh, and now um, it's my pleasure, after welcoming you, to formally introduce um, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Far Curlin, um, who's the co-director of the program on medicine and religion, associate professor of medicine, and an associate faculty member of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Um, Far uh, graduated from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine um, and then came to the University of Chicago for his uh, residency and, fe and fellowship. Um, as many of you know, his empirical research is really groundbreaking national surveys about uh, physicians, um, both religious and secular, um, and their deep moral commitments and its impact on their uh, practice. Um, he also does normative uh, work um, on the ways in which physicians' religious commitments ought to shape uh, their clinical practices in a pluralistic uh, democracy. He's particularly interested in the questions raised by conscience. Um, he remains an active clinician, caring mostly for patients um, at the end of life. Um, he's a friend and a colleague to many of us uh, in this room, and especially to me. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Dr. Far Curlin. Well, I certainly uh, join Dan in expressing my delight to have you here and to see this conference coming uh, about after many months of planning and a lot of hard work by uh, a lot of people, our colleagues and um, staff at the University of Chicago. Um, it's, it, it's, this is a, a really a great pleasure. I want to mention just a couple things, um, logistics things, before we get, uh, get started further. Uh, one is, I'm going to ask if maybe whoever's got the slides, if they can make this stop just so it's not distracting. Maybe hold right there. Um, uh, the second is that, as you may see, have noticed in the brochure, uh, there is time set apart in the morning for uh, worship. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to be, uh, wanted uh, to be as part of the conference is a recognition that to uh, religious faith is not just a matter of, uh, of the mind, but um, uh, Religious faith is grounded in practices, uh, shared practices. So there's a space for that. It's obviously not required uh, of any of you. And I want to mention specifically that we did not intend uh, to suggest that uh, there will be a space for Christians and another for Catholics. Um, <laughs> I told Dan the fact that he's a co-director, I think, will let people know that that was not intentional. Um, but there is, there's going to be a, cath a space for Catholic Mass at 7 a.m., and that's going to be held in the Great Lakes Grand Ballroom. Is that where we are now? Okay, right here. Catholic Mass will be uh, uh, held here. Uh, and then the other room that, where it says Christian is going to actually be uh, Protestant, uh, a time of Protestant uh, prayer and, and, and uh, uh, worship. There's also a, a room set aside uh, for Muslim prayer, as many of you will notice. We've, we've scheduled the breaks so that we can accommodate uh, the times for Muslim prayer. Now, it's, turn, it's my privilege to kind of get us started by um, addressing how this conference came about. 
my father was, uh, my father's still living, but he's retired now, and he was an old school OBGYN. He worked night and day. I remember him coming home at dinner time, usually with big dark circles under his eyes, looking rather haggard. And as soon as dinner was over, he would take two or three steps into the adjoining room and lay face down on the carpet. And he would call to two or three of his seven children and ask us to rub his feet or walk on his back. <laughs> and within usually 20 to 45 seconds, he would go to sleep. And I remember that we would, as we thought about trying to, we would kind of try to gently stop rubbing his feet in a way that he wouldn't wake up uh, so we could get away from that task. Um, but very often in that moment, his beeper would go off. Uh, it wasn't a beeper, actually. It was those old school, you know, those, you remember those big box pagers, you know, Dr. Carlin, please call L&D. Dr. Carlin, please call L&D. And my dad would rouse himself, kind of pat us on the head, and stumble over to the telephone and return the call. And after a, a few moments of uh, shared code language about sonometers and, and uh, timing and so on, he would kiss us and walk out the front door and into the night. And we would often not see him again for two or three days. Now, there's maybe something not right about that, but, uh, but uh, something about it captivated me. That there was something out there in the hospital that called him uh, that was important enough that whenever he got the call, he responded every time. And this conference has come about because people continue to get sick. And in their sickness, as they have through all, throughout all history, they call for a response. And healthcare professionals in particular perceive themselves, we per perceive our per ourselves, to be called to respond. So what we're here to do, in essence, is to ask what it means to respond faithfully to the call of the sick. And in addressing this question, to take into account traditions, and communities, experiences, and the intellectual and moral resources that are explicitly and particularly religious. In my own journey in medicine, there are four moments in which I've been personally confronted with pivotal questions at the intersection of religion and medicine. If I go back to 1994, I was in Guatemala City. Uh, in order to spend some time learning Spanish, I had deferred medical school after being accepted the prior spring. I didn't realize, however, that I was going to have the time of my life, a really transformational time in Guatemala, working with this little group of Guatemalan Christians who were seeking to serve and, and see transformation in the lives of the people who worked in and around the Guatemala City garbage dump. And in the, the, the thrill, frankly, of that uh, experience, I was confronted with the question, should I become a doctor? Before, the question for me had been, the answer for me had been obvious. Uh, it was settled. But now, in that moment, I wondered, well, why? Why not stay in Guatemala? Why not be a pastor? Why not do something else with this one life that I have? My guess is many of you have faced similar questions about your own work. And frankly, right now, uh, through, over, around North America, throughout the world, thousands of people are asking themselves similar questions about becoming or remaining nurses, physicians, pharmacists, physical therapists, chaplains, and other healthcare professionals. Just last month, I was seated on a flight next to a man uh, who was a retired chaplain from Arizona. Uh, I'm sorry, a retired prison chaplain from Arizona. And he was asking himself at that moment in his life, what should I do with the rest of my life? Specifically, should I continue pastoring this little church I've been pastoring, or should I become a hospice chaplain? 
Now these questions come up when, obviously they come up when one is considering uh, entry into a practice or a profession. But the questions continue to assert themselves over time. In my own case, the question, why should I be a doctor, uh, has come back with a sort of haunting insistence over the years, demanding of me an account of why my work is uh, worthwhile, why it's sufficiently worthwhile to be continued rather than spending my time doing something else. Sometimes the question comes with more bite uh, than at others. And the question's obviously a personal one, but, but it's not private. These are not private questions because they're questions that, they're questions about whether and why we will commit ourselves to public practices, the various public practices of the healing arts. And the personal queries, I think, express a deeper question. How does the practice of medicine fit within a good life? A life well lived. For me in Guatemala, anxiously pondering my own uh, future, for the man I sat next to on that airplane, and for countless others throughout history and into the present, including many of you, that question implies a corollary question. How does the practice of medicine fit within a faithful life? A life understood to be directed to and accountable to God. So the first big question to which this conference is devoted is how does the practice of medicine fit within a good and faithful life? That involves questions about what sort of practice medicine is, what it's for, what sort of creatures humans are, what we can know about the shape of a good and faithful life for creatures like us, how medicine fits into those descriptions. And in, in the space of this conference, we'll reason together about the answers to these questions coming at them from a lot of different angles. For example, this afternoon we're going to hear more about how medicine has fit into what people have understood to be faithful lives uh, from the ancient world to the present. We hope that learning more about where we've come from helps us to get a better grasp on uh, where we're going. In tomorrow morning's plenary session, four scholars and clinicians will address the question, is medicine a spiritual practice or in what ways and to what extent? Others will address questions related to that one uh, in the breakout sessions, both, both before and after that plenary. In answering all of these questions, the conference invites both intra-religious, intra-faith, intra-traditional dialogue and scholarship, where we can reason together uh, about a topic within, for example, the tradition of Sunni Islam or Roman Catholic Christianity or conservative Judaism, as well as interfaith or interreligious uh, scholarship, where we do our best to understand one another across different traditions and to reason together on the basis of the, the common world we inhabit, shared goals, and common experiences with respect to health and illness and medicine. Cultivating both types of scholarship is uh, not easy, and I think if it were easy, it would happen more often. Um, but cultivating both intra-traditional and intra-faith and inter-traditional and inter-faith dialogue that's, is a real central value for us, central value of this conference. So we, I want to beg your patience and ask your input as we try to figure out how best to do this, both over the next two days and uh, in the future. We hope that by providing a context in which to, to ask how the practice of medicine fits within a good and faithful life, the conference it will be a resource uh, to healthcare professionals, stimulating them to continually reconsider their own answers to this question so that they can go about their work, so that you can go about your work, and I can go about my work in a new way, having become more persuaded and having greater clarity about how that work is meaningful and valuable uh, and even enough to be the cause of joy. I returned to the United States from Guatemala and started medical school at the University of North Carolina. Two years later, I found myself in a small group session doing 
uh, what was called at the University of North Carolina, Medicine and Society. And I was, I was grateful for a chance to step back from the whirlwind of basic science courses that are part of the preclinical years, as many of you know. And I'd already, although I'd had very little experience with patients, I'd already had enough experience with individuals, uh, patients, to know that there was more to medicine than science could know. Indeed, my first patient, who I'd been sent to meet and to take a history on, as a just kind of getting my feet wet, was a man in his 20s dying of AIDS. I'll never forget him. He was nearly blind in his left eye from CMV retinitis. His right eye was a glass prosthesis, and it didn't fit properly in his socket uh, because he was so profoundly cachectic. As a medical student, I obviously couldn't do anything to help him. So I listened to his story. It turns out he lost his eye when he was beaten severely by some men in his hometown, a small town in North Carolina, who attacked him for being a homosexual. That was the least of it. His story was filled with heartbreaking brokenness and pain. And I remember him weeping, just sobbing, uh, particularly over the fact that he was likely to die estranged from his mother, still not reconciled to his mother, from whom he had been estranged for several years. As you can imagine, I just sat there listening to him, dumbfounded. So when I got to the small group sessions on the social context of medicine, I nodded my head at the notion that medicine cannot be reduced to scientific data, that there's an art in addition to the science, and that patients demand a holistic patient-centered response that included even, at times, attention to patient's spiritual concerns. And I affirmed as self-evidently true that, yes, doctors should be ethical. The language of professionalism was not yet in vogue uh, at that time, in 1995. Yet I found myself asking, what does all of this mean? Perhaps you found yourself asking that in your own context. And I was confronted, I think, with the a version uh, or versions of the second big question to which this conference is devoted, which is what, what have science and ethics and religion to do with one another, and what have all of those to do with the practice of medicine? So there's more to medicine than science and data, but what is, what is the more, in fact, and what's its relation to science? in the practice of medicine. So there's a spiritual dimension to medicine and to the experience of illness, but what is that spiritual dimension? D does it have any substance, any content? Is it real? How does it matter, if at all, in the end, for what I do as a clinician? I could hardly ob object, as I said, to the notion that healthcare professionals should practice ethically but what would ethical practice entail, concretely? Moreover, I wondered how is it that medical students like I was at that time or other healthcare professionals come to be good professionals, a good physician, characterized by making ethical choices? And I wondered, does being a faithful Christian or a Jew or Muslim have anything to do with being a good physician? And if so, if there's some connection, well, what is that connection? This conference exists as a context in which to reason together about these sorts of questions. This afternoon, speakers will describe some of how these questions have been understood over history. In Friday's plenary, three scholars will address the question of the relations of science, ethics, and religion, and, their, and the practice of medicine will address those head on. Tomorrow, there'll be a panel on three different views of integrating spirituality and medicine, pro proposing some more concrete ways of thinking about that. There'll be several talks about theological understandings of the body and their implications for ethics and medicine. There'll be talks that explore the experience of sickness and which relate sickness to the problem of evil. There'll be a panel on conscience in the practice of medicine. 
There will even be a panel uh, asking if only theology can save medicine. And in answering these questions, presenters will bring all manner of resources to the table, including the resources of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I didn't resolve my questions about the relationship of science, ethics, and religion in medicine back at University of North Carolina, but I pressed on, um, finished medical school, went to residency, uh, trained as an internist, and I, I, was, I was happy uh, being a physician. Uh, I really I enjoyed it. There were thrilling moments. There were deeply satisfying moments. And yet along the way, another question began uh, to trouble me. I had many moments in which I sensed, often inchoately, but I sensed that what we were doing to patients and what we were proposing to do or ostensibly doing for patients were not so obviously good. Some of those moments were familiar ones. Um, as many of you have had the experience of being in the intensive care unit and continuing life-sustaining uh, technological interventions on patients that seem to be long past the point of no return in, in the dying process. Other moments were more mon mundane. In my primary cl clinic, I found myself wondering really basic things. Like, why was I spending my time encouraging this patient to get a colonoscopy rather than focusing on his diabetes management? Or why was I focusing on her diabetes management rather than adding another blood pressure pill? Or why was I adding a blood pressure pill rather than addressing the back pain that brought this patient to the clinic? Or why was I treating the back pain at all? At a cost to someone, whether the state or uh, their employer, of 300 or more dollars per visit, I remember a young woman who walked into my clinic, I remember her very well, walked into my clinic with a cane hunched over, a young woman in her early 30s, shaking, tremul trembling, looking pitiful. And I found out that she was on two muscle relaxants, four or five pain medications, two antidepressants, an antipsychotic, and an anti-seizure medicine. Three years earlier, she had hurt her back working for an industrial employer and got into a dispute with her employer about responsibility and about disability. And three years later, after several dozen physician visits, 15 psychoactive, roughly 15 psychoactive medications and a three-inch medical binder, she presented to me. And as I looked at her, I thought, what are we, we physicians, we healthcare professionals, we healthcare system, what are we doing to this patient? And what is it that we are proposing that we're doing for this patient? How did we end up here? How did she end up here seeing me to help her with this? How did I end up here and other people end up doing the things that we were doing? And this is a conference to reason together about such questions. The weight of those questions led me personally to take some time away from full-time clinical practice and to learn to do empirical research and to think more about this intersection of religion and medicine. And in my first empirical research project, colleagues and I found that, Dan, Dan alluded to this work, but we found that contrary to conventional wisdom at the time, US physicians were more or less as religious as the general population in the US which bucked, a, bucked at least two trends in which higher wealth and more education are associated with being less religious. Moreover, we found that the majority of doctors, 55% of US physicians agreed with the statement, my religious beliefs influence my practice of medicine. When the study was finally over, or not finally over, when it was finally published, I started getting phone calls from reporters and every one of them, by the way, if you want to get phone calls from reporters about your work, do you got to study politics, sex, or religion? And uh, you will get phone calls. Um, 
when the, and if you put them all together, you know, you really, you really get phone calls, as I've learned recently. Um, every one of these reporters had the same question, a version of this question. After, you know, asking me, what did the data find, so on, they say, well, how, how do doctors' religious beliefs influence their practice of medicine? How do they make an impact? Where, where, what kind of differences do they make? At the time, I couldn't answer that question. But in the years since, my colleagues and I have found that physicians' religious characteristics, including being not religious, uh, account for many variations in physicians' clinical practices and across a pretty wide array of clinical domains. That research reflects or invokes uh, the third big question to which this conference is devoted. How do religion, religious faith, religious practice, and medicine influence and impact one another? How does religious faith of, of a particular form impact healthcare professionals' practices of medicine and patients' uses of medicine and communities' ways of thinking about medicine? How does medicine impact the ideas and practices that are a part of religious faith? This is a context, this conference is a context in which to reason together about many dimensions of this question drawing on all forms of scholarship. Just to give you a few examples to kind of whet your appetite for the next couple of days. With respect to historical scholarship, we're going to again hear this afternoon about how medicine and religion influenced one another from the ancient world uh, into 20th century America. With respect to empirical research, there'll be a presentation, uh, presentation about the perspectives of mental health providers on incorporating religious ideas into clinical practice. With respect to conceptual or theoretical uh, scholarship, there'll be a panel asking whether palliative care can save the life of reform Jewish congregations. Another on the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary care as that has been developed in Catholic uh, moral theology. Another about Islamic uh, perspectives on withdrawing uh, and or withholding life support. With respect to just descriptive studies, um, uh, there will be a presentation about the rise and fall of the American Jewish Hospital, another about public health activism in the African American church, another about the experiences of Muslim healthcare professionals in contemporary American medicine. With respect to normative scholarship, where arguments are going to be advanced um, about how we ought to practice and make use of medicine, there will be paper presentations on Catholic uh, approaches to the treatment of rape victims, Jewish perspectives on organ donation, and Islamic ethico-legal reasoning about prenatal screening. In different ways, these presentations draw on the disciplines of careful observation, of course, and study to describe how religion and medicine do appear to impact one another in the past and in the present. The presentations also draw on Judaism Christianity, and Islam as resources to understand how religion and medicine should impact one another, understood within the framework of and with reference to these particular traditions. Back to my story. I'm still in the fourth moment in which I regularly ask the fourth question as I think about it, to which this conference is directed, which is, well, what, what can be done what can be done that might result in more faithful practices of medicine, more faithful practitioners, and might result in more self-consciously uh, faithful uses of medicine? Now, this is an academic conference. We do not presume to advance any answer to these questions that would satisfy any, everyone here. But it is a conference about medicine, and medicine is a practical, it's a practice. As such, this conference is a context in which to reason together about what can and should be done practically to bring about, to realize, better practices and better uses of medicine. In this vein, we'll hear presentations, for example, about, uh, as I mentioned before, three different modes of integrating spirituality and medicine, presumably in hopes that by thinking clearly about this, we can discern which ones are better than others. We'll hear about a local church's strategy for caring for a member with bipolar disorder, an example of a community uh, taking action 
to try to respond to the call of the sick. We'll hear about being sick itself, that experience as a vocation. And we'll learn uh, some lessons learned from two wounded healers. We'll hear about Catholic missionary nursing in the 20th century. And it's hope that by asking about what has been done and what can be done, this conference is going to help your good ideas to germinate and to disseminate. That together we will come up in conversation together, we'll come up with new initiatives. We'll go out try them, come back and talk about what we've learned. In that respect, I want to say a, a brief word about uh, something that came to me just in the past week. And that is, it occurred to me that at the very heart of faith, at least as, as certainly as it's understood in, in Christianity, my own faith, but as I understand it also in, certainly in Judaism and, and Islam, at the very heart of faith is a, a command by God, both a command and a kind of an encouragement to not be afraid. And it strikes me that medicine is, I'm sure this is not unique to medicine, but there, it's filled with uh, possibilities for fear. Fear of offense, uh, fear of being misunderstood, fear of making a mistake, fear of being found out when you have made a mistake, um, fear of taking responsibility, Fear of failure, fear of suffering, fear of death. There are all these opportunities for fear. And yet if you, if I think about, for example, certainly in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian scriptures, you have these ringing calls, be not afraid. The one thing you should fear is God, God's self. And... Uh, so one of the questions that comes to mind to reason about, frankly, is what, what would medicine look like if folks were not afraid, if, if, uh, if practices were developed that were not pinned in by fear of all the ways that things might fail, all of the things that might go wrong, all the ways in which we sense that we might be undone if they do go wrong. So this is a conference uh, in which to consider age-old questions. How does the practice of medicine fit within a good and faithful life? What have science, ethics, and religion to do with each other? And what have they to do with the practice of medicine, with the use of medicine? How do religion, religious faith, religious practices, and medicine, how do they impact one another, influence one another? And what could be done that might result in more faithful practices of medicine, more self-consciously uh, faithful uses of medicine. Toward the end, uh, one would hope of uh, better medicine. I want to close by encouraging you to get involved. You're already, you've taken a big step in coming, for which um, I am deeply grateful and, and excited to get to know many of you. But I encourage you to get, to get involved. The program on medicine and religion, which which Dan and I have the privilege of co-directing, and I want to mention um, uh, my gratitude toward as well our, our colleague Asim Padella, who leads our initiative on uh, Islam and medicine. Um, we're hoping to also develop a, and are working to develop an initiative on Judaism and medicine. Um, anyway, this program exists to serve healthcare professionals and patients by promoting scholarship and dialogue at the intersection of religion and medicine. So please talk to us throughout this time and in the future. Uh, talk to us about how we can do better uh, to serve that end. Tell us specifically what works about this conference and what needs changing. Tell us what you, you most experience as the things that are missing. You're going to experience things that are missing. You're going to feel that there are holes here that need to be filled. Please tell us what those are and uh, help us think about how to, to uh, develop this in a way that really serves the goals um, uh, and provides the values that we hope for. And you know, this, will not, this kind of work does not develop uh, without a community that contributes to and finds value in it. And you won't contribute to it if you don't find value in it. So a few tangible ways to get involved. Think about 
already, as you go through, make notes. Make a spot in your booklets, even now. Make notes to yourself about what you could present at next year's conference, either yourself or, or by yourself or with a colleague. There will be a call for submissions or abstracts. It will come out in late summer, early fall. Um, you'll all get that because you're all, you all come here. We have all your contact information. So you'll get that, that, that call, and I encourage you to submit. In addition, every one of you knows at least a handful of people that have a lot to contribute to this conversation uh, that would add a lot of value to it and that would also derive value from it and that are not here today. So I encourage you to think about who they are, make a note to yourself, and spread the word. Encourage them maybe to present something with you next year. We particularly need help connecting to the nursing community, to the community of chaplains, and to other communities of healthcare professionals uh, in, in, the, in the array of the, the healing arts, all the people who are all tied up together working to respond to the call of the sick. Uh, so if you know of how to connect to that, or if you're connected to those communities, and uh, you can think of ways that we can help, that can help us connect to them, please let us know that and, and help us do it. Also in your packet, is a piece of paper asking you to consider volunteering to serve in a few ways. Uh, to serve on a planning committee um, for next year's conference, to review abstracts when they're submitted in the fall, or to moderate sessions, and I think there's a couple other ways that you can uh, indicate an interest in helping out. Please consider that. I, I imagine personally, speaking for myself here, I imagine a future in which it is common knowledge that medicine and religion are inextricably connected to one another, bearing on one another in different ways, and in which it's usual and customary for health professionals and clergy and lay people to think about, think hard about, and to thoughtfully develop those connections. I imagine a future in which healthcare professionals, or at least most of them, can give a reasoned account to themselves and to their colleagues, and even to their patients, of how the practice of medicine fits within a good and faithful life as they understand it. And that that account that they would give would draw on the depth of and the particularity of their own tradition, whether it's a secular tradition or a religious tradition, and would be at the same time knowledgeable of how that account relates to other accounts from other traditions. We'd understand what's different, what's shared, and what's at stake in those differences. And I would hope that that account would not just be an abstraction, an intellectual uh, point of detachment, um, but that it would be an account that infuses the healthcare professional's work, infuses your work, uh, infuses my work, with meaning, purpose, a sense of commitment, direction, and even joy. So, and I imagine a, a, a future in which at this conference and at other venues, we hear about and share with one another a growing number of experiments and innovations through which patients and religious communities seek to use medicine faithfully, and in which healthcare professionals respectfully work out in dialogue with each other more faithful practices of medicine. Practices that, insofar as they understand it, to the best of their ability to understand and, and uh, to the best of their ability to carry out, practices that more adequately respond to the call of the sick. Thank you. And I'll be, I think, happy to take a couple questions at this point, Dan, or should, I, should we move forward? Move forward. Okay, great. Our next uh, speaker, uh, we're really delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Gary uh, Ferngren, um, who's a professor of history at Oregon State University uh, and the Sandy and Elva Sanders eminent professor in university honors. He's written extensively, and many of us have uh, profited from his writings on the history of medicine in the ancient world and on the historical relationship of science and religion. His publications include Medicine and Healthcare in Early Christianity, Medicine in Hellenized Jews, 
lore and early Christian literature, um, uh, science and religion, a historical introduction, um, of which he's the editor, um, the history of science and religion in the Western tradition, of which he's the general editor, and he's just completed a manuscript of a new book, uh, Medicine and Religion, a Historical uh, Introduction. So if we're going to begin with the history, I think there's safe to say there's nobody better to begin with than uh, Dr. G Gary Ferngren. So thank you. Dr. Curlin, Dr. Silmassi, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be with you. To many who live in a modern secular society, a connection between religion and medicine is not readily apparent. Not to this group, of course. To associate religion with healing seems to many an anachronism that is incompatible with scientific medicine. In fact, however, the two have had a close relationship ever since the earliest human attempts to heal the human body. In the ancient world, when little was known about medicine or the structure of the human body, healers realized that they could do little to restore health to those who were ill. The causes of disease seemed mysterious, and they were often ascribed to magic or to divine beings. Of common diseases, only symptoms could be ordinarily treated. And for more serious conditions, healers hoped that by appealing to supernatural forces, they might gain help. Those who attempted healing did not need to be priests or physicians to understand that where they could do so little, the best and perhaps the only hope of physical restoration came from the gods. Religion still intersects with medicine today in surprisingly diverse day, ways, which we will examine in these meetings. Some of them assume forms not very different from those that they took in the ancient world. For example, helping to uh, relieve the pain and suffering of the sick, to provide compassionate care for those who are ill, and to offer spiritual consolation to the sick and the dying. Let me go back to begin speaking about the Greeks uh, and to determine some of the roots of the Western tradition in medicine and religion. Although a variety of healers existed in ancient Near Eastern civilization, for example, those of Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and Egypt, the Western medical tradition properly begins with the Greeks. It was in the fifth century BCE that Greek medicine began to assume the form of an art as well as a craft. An art requires the existence of a body of theoretical knowledge, which until the late fifth century did not exist in medicine. Many empirical techniques were collected and transmitted by empirics and folk healers, but they could not really be called a body of knowledge. There had been few previous attempts to understand disease in general terms or to frame broad theories that could be applied to particular cases. It was the addition of theory to medicine and to the formulation of concepts of disease that made it possible to explain illness in terms of natural causation, which became a feature of Greek medicine in the fifth century BCE. Physicians who sought a theoretical understanding of disease turned to philosophy, which alone could provide universal, universal formulations for the medical art. We term these physicians Hippocratic doctors, after the celebrated father of medicine, Hippocrates, who lived in the fifth century BCE. Although Hippocrates was the subject of much legend, we know almost nothing about him. Only two contemporary references exist to him, both of them in the dialogues of Plato, who was roughly a contemporary. He probably became the subject of widespread interest during the Hellenistic period, which followed the death of Alexander the Great in 323, when a number of anonymous medical works came to be attributed to him. They are known as the Hippocratic Corpus, or the Hippocratic Treatises, and they number about 60 different works. None of them can be attributed with any certainty to Hippocrates, and most scholars doubt that any were actually authored by him. They form a disparate group of writings. Most of them were probably composed in the 5th or 4th centuries BCE, but some date to a couple of centuries later. They were written by both physicians and laypersons. They represent many different points of view. 
But some of them, good many of them, assume um, an approach that is both rational and empirical. Rational in their freedom from magic or demonic ideologies and in their belief in the natural causes of disease and empirical in their collection of case histories which give detailed symptoms of disease. Side by side with the development of a naturalistic tradition of medicine in classical Greece, there existed a parallel tradition of religious medicine in which the sick sought healing directly from a god rather than from a physician. Those who desired divine help for healing could, be, could apply to a variety of gods, demigods, and heroes. Originally, in Greek mythology, there were no special gods of healing. Any deity could be invoked by the sick. But one hero, Asclepius, came to be the chief god of healing in the classical world, probably by the 6th century BCE. By the 4th century, in the northern Peloponnesian city of Epidaurus, a center was developed, a healing sanctuary for Asclepius, and his cult spread from Epidaurus throughout the Greek and Roman worlds. The sick came to his temples for healing, often for diseases that medicine could not heal, chronic diseases, those for which physicians had given up hope. Pilgrims underwent first a purification, offered a simple sacrifice, suited to the means of each pilgrim. And then the healing process involved something called incubation. Incubation was the practice of having pilgrims sleep on a couch overnight in a chamber called the abaton. It was there during the night that the pilgrim waited for a dream or a vision from the god himself. He would appear to heal them or to give advice on the kind of healing that should be pursued. Asclepius often hold, held a staff with a snake coiled around it. It later became the famous medical icon, the Caduceus. Sometimes in a dream, Asclepius merely touched patients. Sometimes he performed surgery on them or he administered drugs. On occasion, a sacred serpent or a dog would come to lick the afflicted portion of the pilgrim. When the person awoke the next morning, he or she might be healed. We know that a number were because they've left votive offerings at the temple of Epidaurus and other temples. They have been found in abundance and they testify to the healing that Asclepius could bring. They include terracotta models of eyes, ears, limbs, or parts of the body that were healed. And they're quite striking. One can see similar votive offerings today in many healing sites throughout the world. But Asclepius not only, held, not only healed patients by supernatural means, but he also healed through secular means, that is, through conventional medicine. Indeed, he became the patron of physicians who practiced secular medicine. Physicians swore an oath by Asclepius and by other healing gods, and they had no professional objections to supernatural healing in temples. Rather, they viewed it as uh, paralleling or complementing their own work. Some temples even, even um, employed physicians within the temple precincts itself. When a Greek physician felt that he could no longer help a patient, he refused to uh, provide further treatment. That left the patient free to seek the help of Asclepius. The two traditions, secular medicine and temple healing, existed side by side, often with little or no contact, but apparently with no tension. During the Hellenistic period, after 323 BC, a number of other foreign deities entered Greece from the ancient Near East, from Syria or Asia Minor or Egypt. Some of them, like Serapis, inspired their own healing cults, but none seriously challenged the primacy of Asclepius. The best known document of the Hippocratic collection is the so-called Hippocratic Oath. It is uncertain when it was written, or by whom, 
and we find the earliest mention of it in the first century CE. There is no evidence that it was used in the pre-Christian era. Those who took the oath swore by Apollo, Asclepius, and other gods and goddesses of healing to guard their art in purity and holiness. Some of its injunctions, such as um, its prohibition of abortion or euthanasia and perhaps of surgery, together with its religious tenor, suggest that it originated among a small or limited group of physicians, perhaps those who had religious inclinations. There's definitely a religious tone to the oath. The oath was regarded by some Greek and Roman medical writers during the Roman period as setting forth an ideal standard for the ethical or professional approach that physicians should take. But it was never at any time in the classical world, the ancient world, used as an oath administered by physicians who had to take it. Perhaps a minority, but we're not even sure of that. The deontological treatises of the Hippocratic corpuses, uh, corpus, rather, precepts, decorum, law, provide the earliest medical writings that deal with moral obligation and what we would call today medical etiquette. They define a distinct identity for the physician and they establish guidelines for professional conduct. They were rooted in the culture of the medical craftsman rather than in any moral or religious values. They are professional documents. But in defining the obligations of the physician for the first time, they created a tradition of medical ethics, and they also formulated an ideal of competent practice, which was subsequently adopted in the classical world by physicians, but also in the Middle Ages by Jewish and Christian and Muslim physicians. These deontological treatises have done more than any other body of writers, writings rather, to influence the Western medical tradition to the present day. And I believe that they remain one of the greatest legacies of what we call, rather loosely, Hippocratic medicine. Let me turn now to Rome. According to tradition, Rome was founded in 753 BC. For the first six centuries, the Romans lived either without medicine or physicians. And here I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing an ancient Roman writer. They used folk medicines. They supplemented them with magic and divination that they inherited from the Etruscans who had controlled Rome at an earlier stage. The el eldest male member of the household, the pater familias, administered folk remedies to his household. And they included, the household included slaves, members of the family up to the third generation. Often it was a considerable number of people living under the same roof. A well-known example was the conservative and xenophobic senator Cato the Elder, who in the second century BCE compiled a book of recipes that he used in treating members of his household who were ill. And this would include quite a broad spectrum of people. Cato relied on Folk remedies, together with prayers, sacrifices, magical incantations to protect his own children, his crops, his herds. He was renowned for his use of cabbage, which he regarded as a kind of general panacea, and he was famous for his contempt of Roman physicians and their medicines. The earliest Roman religion was animistic. That is, the Romans initially worshipped vague spirits that had no defined personalities. Uh, we call them, or rather the Romans called them, noumena. Under the influence of the Etruscans, they began to define some of these noumena into gods. And eventually, some of them became identified with Greek gods of similar characteristics. But the animistic tendency of Roman religion remained for centuries. The earliest Romans had no distinct gods of healing, but certain deities, in fact almost any, might be appealed to if they were thought to be concerned with special bodily parts or bodily functions. Sometimes, if prayers were unsuccessful in bringing healing or the end to a pestilence, the Romans might search abroad for foreign deities. Romans were open to other cultures seemingly without any problems. 
So for example, in 291, a severe pestilence raged at Rome for several years. The Romans eventually sent um, a ship to Epidaurus, the chief sanctuary of Asclepius, requesting that the god Asclepius come to Rome. And according to the legend, he did. He came aboard the ship in the form of a serpent. The ship carried him to Rome up the Tiber River to the Tiber Island. And when it docked, the uh, serpent um, left the ship, establishing his desire to dwell in Rome. And the Romans built a temple and adopted him as the god Aesculapius. That was the name by which he was known in Rome. The Romans believed that every function was under the supervision or protection of a particular deity. Every stage of life, from conception, gestation, and birth, was subject to a particular Newman. And so the protection of a Newman would be sought for a particular uh, form of illness or physical dysfunction. Given the dangers of childbearing, um, death in childbirth was extremely common in most pre-modern societies. So a Roman patron might appeal to a number of goddesses or noumena. And incantations, magical formulas were often recited together with a laying on of hands which was thought to transfer the power of the goddess and to provide um, safety in childbirth or healing. The Romans were expansionist by nature, and in 216, they began a series of wars in the Eastern Mediterranean with the Greeks that led in about a century to their conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean, including the mainland of Greece. As a result, Greek slaves, or I should say Greek physicians, migrated to Rome, many of them as slaves who had been captured in overseas wars, and they were widely accepted by the Romans in a city that previously had had no physicians at all. For several centuries, the Western Roman Empire largely went to physicians who were Greeks. That was true not just for generations, but for many centuries. And the reason was in part because educated Romans considered the practice of medicine a mere craft and beneath their dignity. Some nativist types like Cato the Elder and the first century encyclopedist Pliny the Elder continued to distrust Greek physicians and to rely on popular and traditional folk remedies, even after the introduction and success that was enjoyed by Greek physicians in the Roman Empire. Pliny himself, who had a voracious appetite for recording um, materials related to medicine, included many folk and magical remedies in his influential encyclopedia, Natural History. Throughout the history of Greek and Roman cultures, a medical pluralism prevailed, which meant that there was a variety of healers, none enjoying absolute primacy, and that included physicians, exorcists, magicians, herbalists, and others, but also healing gods, because healing cults of various gods and heroes were available to any who sought them, and that included indigenous, but especially foreign deities. Asclepius continued, however, throughout the Roman Empire to remain the most popular um, healing god. And in fact, a recent book has found about 750 temples and shrines and healing sites that were associated with Asclepius. With the spread of a rationalistic outlook in the early centuries of the Roman Empire, the nature of the cures that were offered by Asclepius changed so that miraculous healing, the traditional means of healing by the god, was replaced by therapeutics that were in many respects not very different from those offered by a physician. So that instead of supernatural healing uh, through incubation, Asclepius's priests often recommended naturalistic regimens of exercise, swimming, diet, and purgatives to pilgrims who came to the sites. The extent of belief in astrology, in magic, in exorcism varied over the centuries of classical antiquity. At all times, natural healing, whether by empirics or medical practitioners of rational medicine, was a widely accepted but not an exclusive means of healing. Although many physicians considered Asclepius to be their patron, 
Their medicine remained devoid of any religious or magical elements. One of the greatest legacies of classical culture was rational and empirical medicine. Irrespective of the, of the enormous changes and developments in its theoretical and practical aspects over the last two and a half millennia, um, healing by natural means through medicine has remained the expectation in Western cultures of all those who have chosen to seek a physician rather than an alternative healer. I now turn to early Christianity. Although a superficial reading would suggest otherwise, outside the Gospels and the reported healings of Jesus, one finds little reference to miraculous healing in the New Testament. The Epistle of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, prescribes a rite of healing that calls clergy of the church to, appoint, to anoint the sick and to pray for their recovery. But we have no evidence that this rite was used before the third century, and it is possible that it refers to spiritual healing and not to physical illness. It does not appear, moreover, that in the first three centuries of the Christian era, specifically religious healing played a major role in the church's ministry to the sick. Leading Christian writers of the period exhibit generally positive views of medicine. Thus, the third century Father Origen describes medicine as beneficial and essential to mankind. His contemporary, Tertullian, who was fond of employing medical analogies in his theological writings, believed also that medicine was beneficial for Christians to use. In fact, although the evidence is slight and largely circumstantial, it appears that Christians employed medicine, as did virtually all other religious and non-religious population groups within the classical Mediterranean world. Far from being distrusted by Christians, medical treatment came to be regarded as a model for the cure of the soul. The theme of Jesus as Christus Medicus, that is, the great physician, was already being employed in the first quarter of the second century. But it was used in a generally metaphorical sense to describe Jesus as the savior of sin-sick souls and not as a physical healer. Early Christians regarded disease as one aspect of the material rather than the moral evil that had arisen since the fall of Adam. Christians looked on illness as the result of natural, if providential, causes that could be treated by physicians or other healers, such as folk healers, of whom a broad spectrum existed in what we call the medical marketplace of the classical world. And I've mentioned before the herbalists, the folk healers, midwives, and many other groups. Evidence that early Christians commonly believed in a demonic etiology of disease is almost entirely lacking. Like most others, they accepted a natural causation of disease. Christians broke bones and contracted illnesses, like their pagan and Jewish neighbors, for which they ordinarily consulted physicians, that is, if they could afford them. When medical or natural means did not avail, they were encouraged to rely on prayer. But in cases for which no relief was possible, Christians were advised to submit patiently to God's will. Early Christian writers repeatedly speak of suffering as intended by God to produce spiritual maturity. Faith and trust in God, they believed, could transform suffering into a positive experience that produced Christian graces such as humility, patience, and dependence on God and his will. Belief in religious healing, however, has always existed in Christianity. Origen maintained that Christians who wish to live in an ordinary way should use medical means. Those who wish to live in a superior, that is, a more spiritual manner, should instead employ prayer for healing. By the 5th century CE, various forms of religious healing had been introduced into the Christian church, first in the east and then into the west. This came about largely through the monastic and ascetic movements which became popular in late antiquity. It was during the life of Augustine, the early fifth century, that healing became increasingly used in the West and it proliferated during the Middle Ages. Healing was often sought through the agency of saints, um, that is, if they were alive, or through their relics and tombs after their death. 
because their remains continued to have the power of healing which the saints exhibited while they were alive. Miracles, as any reader of medieval literature knows, played an important part in the healing of physical affliction. Pilgrimage to shrines became uh, very popular and they filled the pages of the lives of saints which proliferated in late antiquity and we see them even in works like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. The tradition of supernatural healing has endured in both the Roman Catholic and Orthodox traditions, which have continued to claim miraculous healing in the modern world as a demonstration of God working through his church in every age. Protestants, by contrast, have historically held that miracles ceased with the end of the apostolic age or early Christian times. While well, Protestants believe that God answered prayer, and sometimes healed, they generally considered miraculous healing, and by that I mean healing apart from medical means, to be rare. In the mid-19th century, faith healing gained credence in some American Protestant circles, though most mainstream Protestant denominations continued to reject it in favor of traditional medicine. In the early 20th century, a new movement, Pentecostalism, claimed that the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, which included supernatural healing, were normative and intended to be for every age. So quickly has Pentecostalism spread in its many forms that by the year 2000, over a quarter of the world's two billion Christians, both Protestant and Catholic, have identified themselves as Pentecostals or Charismatics. Early Christians formulated a view of, human, of the human condition in which suffering assumed a positive role that it had previously lacked in the ancient world. In the classical world of Greece and Rome, neither philosophy nor religion encouraged a compassionate response to human suffering. During times of plague, the sick and the dying were often abandoned and corpses were left unburied in order to prevent the spread of contagion. Christians, by contrast, viewed plague or epidemic disease as an opportunity to provide for the care of the sick and the dying. They believed that rather than bringing shame and disapproval, disease and illness gave us the sufferer a favored status that invited sympathy and compassionate care. At the same time, they saw in suffering an opportunity for personal examination that could bring about spiritual illumination. While Christians believed that suffering might be God's chastisement for sin, they did not posit a simple correlation between sin and suffering. Rather, they viewed it as a means of grace for the spiritual benefit of the sufferer. So universal, however, has been the assumption that a connection, sometimes a necessary one, exists between moral failing and sickness that it has remained a dominant theodicy in many societies, including our own. Let me now talk about Christian philanthropy. Classical society saw in philanthropy a potential motive for the practice of medicine, but it was never believed in Greco-Roman culture to be an essential virtue. Although philanthropy was sometimes said by the second century writer Galen, for example, to be a possible motivation for a physician to undertake healing, it was not necessary. There was no virtue or ideal of compassion in the ancient world that was required of physicians. The Christian church, however, believed that compassion was an essential component of healing, and it created in the first two centuries of existence the only organization in the Roman world that cared for the sick. And that began with the healing, um, first of all, in the church itself, and then the founding of hospitals. The best known, in fact, the earliest hospital was the Basileus, which was completed about 372 by Basil the Great in what is today Turkey. His hospital employed a regular live-in medical staff that provided aid to the sick and medical care in the tradition of secular medicine. It spread rapidly, the hospital did, in the Eastern Mediterranean, though much more slowly in the West. Early hospitals and related institutions grew out of the monastic movement, and the widespread existence of monastic orders provided much of the personnel to staff them. Hospitals were founded specifically to care for the poor, and the pattern persisted until the mid-19th century, and hospitals remained for centuries what they had intended to be from the beginning, namely institutions for the indigent. Those who could afford a physician's care received it in their own homes. 
A long trajectory exists from the reign of Hippocratic medicine to the 19th century and even to our own time. The Greeks created an art of medicine that was grounded in a theoretical framework that was both empirical and rational. At the same time, Greek physicians were the first to create a professional and ethical standard for medicine that is found most famously in the Hippocratic Oath. In the medical ethical literature of the early Middle Ages, the religious and philanthropic ideas of monastic medicine were merged with the earlier tradition of Hippoc Hippocratic medical ethics, and both came to form important strands in the Western tradition. The New Testament and early Christian literature enjoined Christian philanthropy both on the individual and the corporate level for those who were suffering from physical disabilities. The early church organized a systematic effort to care for the ill through voluntary assistance. It became so successful that it formed the basis for the hospital, which was first organized at the end of the fourth century. Medical philanthropy has played a paramount role in Christian charity among Christians of all traditions. It remains the greatest contribution of Christianity to health care. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker um, will uh, bring us um, a, a quite different perspective. Um, we're going to uh, be pleased to host uh, Professor Osman Bachar, um, who is formerly Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, of the University of Malaya uh, and the Malaysia Chair of Southeast Asian Islam at the Prince uh, Talal al Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. Um, he is currently Deputy Chief Executive Officer um, of the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies um, in Malaysia. Um, he is also Emeritus Professor of the Philosophy of Science at the Department of Science and Technology Studies at the University of Malaya um, and a consultant at the University's Center for Civilizational Dialogue. Um, he's a visiting research fellow of the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies of Monotheism at the uh, Doshisha University of Kyoto, Japan. Um, Dr. Bachar is um, an author of 17 books and nearly 300 articles on various aspects of Islamic thought, uh, particularly Islamic science um, and philosophy. Um, he was a member of the Council of 100 Leaders um, of the um, Islamic West World in, uh, Initiative for Dialogue, founded by the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Um, in 2009, he was named among the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. Um, and that makes it really special that he's with us uh, here today. Um, he has even been honored uh, by the Sultan of Pahang um, and by the King of Malaysia. Um, so he's probably on record as being the person who's come the longest way to uh, present for us uh, today. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Bachar uh, to the podium. Thank you. Uh, let me greet. Uh Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and peace be unto you and a very good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, for having invited me to this very, very important conference. I say a conference on, of this sort is uh, on religion and medicine at a national level is long overdue. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. Um, <clears throat> in my 40 years of uh, my academic career, my main area of concentration uh, is history uh, of science and philosophy of science uh, in Islamic culture. Um, I've never had medical education. My, actually, my option um, to, be, to, to, to undergo, to, to have a medical education, to be a medical doctor was eliminated uh, quite early. Uh, I was somehow, uh, blood put me off. <laughs> and um, I was trained to be, to, be, to, to, be, to, to, to be a scientist, but finally I ended up by just um, joining uh, mathematical uh, physics uh, but later, of course, I decided to do religion. 
And because of my interest in the, doing history and philosophy of science, science and culture, uh, I also have to do uh, the very important component of it, uh, namely uh, religion and uh, medicine in, in Islam. So, um, while well, I say that it is unfortunate that um, uh, I've not been able to have medical uh, education to be a medical doctor, and it is really unfortunate because I've come across claims um, among Muslims um, that in the hereafter, in the next world, the great majority of medical doctors goes to paradise. <laughs> but I have one consolation though, at least uh, I'm doing some studies about them. <laughs> uh, I study about them, about their uh, personal lives, about their intellectual life. So I think uh, if for no other reason, at least to think good of them, I will also be admitted to paradise. So any, I would, what I'll try to do now, I'll try to present uh, in the next half an hour or so, the, the topic of medicine and religion in some culture is just simply an overview uh, I, I would be able to do only the, to do some highlights uh, because uh, there's so much to be said, but I hope through my presentation I will be able to raise certain issues that may be uh, discussed, and uh, um, not only uh, in this hall, but uh, uh, later on. Um, there are just five topics that um, I want to do here briefly. Uh, the historical span of Islamic medicine, the scope of Islamic medicine, the religious and cultural context of Islamic medicine, medicine and other sciences and the other sciences, and medical education and practice, all in Islamic culture. First, the subject of historical span of Islamic medicine. Uh, medicine in Islamic culture is often referred to as Islamic medicine, although uh, there have been some uh, historical works on the subject which also refer to Arabian medicine, which I don't think um, uh, reflects the true situation in history because um, there were other dimensions of Islamic uh, medicine um, which were not expressed in the Arabic language, for example, written in other Muslim languages. But anyway, um, certainly from the viewpoint of Islamic epistemology, I think there is some justification to use that term, Islamic medicine, and I myself uh, use that term to mean um, that that medicine in both theory and practice uh, conform to the, uh, the Islamic uh, the teachings on epistemology, cosmology, and, and ethics. Now, what I mean by uh, epistemological uh, justification for that, what I mean is that the, it is uh, in accord with the Islamic uh, idea of, of, of science, uh, the Arabic word, I mean the plural ulum, um, what they understood is that every science, any academic discipline to be called a science, uh, necessarily has four structural components. First, the subject matter, maudu. Uh, in Arabic, maudu, uh, every science has a well-defined subject matter. The second component is the foundational assumptions. Every science has its own foundational assumptions. And in Arabic, this is muqaddamat. And then, every science has its own methodology, turuk, uh, the, uh, the plural. And then objective, every science, every true science has its own objectives. Uh, ahdaf, the, 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 the plural objectives. And this is why in that sense. So science, uh, medical science uh, satisfies those conditions in having all those uh, components and medicine, uh, medical science treated as a very important branch uh, of these uh, sciences. Uh, as developed in Islamic uh, culture. And um, 
the, in other words, this, uh, the idea of uh, the symbolism of the tree of knowledge. So medical science, uh, a very important branch of that tree uh, of knowledge. And um, the, the idea of unity of knowledge, of course, is very much uh, emphasized. Now, in terms of cosmological, uh, cosmological uh, justification, um, a very important idea in Islamic cosmology, as also in, uh, in, uh, in other, uh, found to, uh, to be found also in Christian cosmology, um, and the, the cosmology, the idea of, uh, uh, the idea of microcosm. Uh, the, 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 uh, the idea of microcosm has a very, very important application in uh, Islamic uh, medicine. Uh, the idea is of one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, ourself, our human being, as a microcosm, the small universe, the small world, and the external uh, reality. That idea of one-to-one -one correspondence has practical implications that one with regard uh, to even uh, dietotherapy, uh, the, the, for example, the influence of diets on, the, on, the, on our own uh, body. And the, uh, in terms of ethics, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that later. Then the second reason to justify the use of Islamic science and Islamic medicine, the concepts of health and illness, or wellness and illness in Islamic medicine uh, are in accord with Islam's spiritual and religious teachings. Uh, the, the epistemology, uh, based on the epistemology of Islamic uh, uh, medicine, uh, for example, you find that the health uh, is well defined. Health has been defined in Islamic medicine as the, uh, as, as the balance, um, the balance between, uh, the balance of all the components of the human person, of the human being, uh, body, uh, uh, soul, mind, and, and, and spirit, but in particular, the uh, balance at physical level, the humoral, uh, the, the balance in the humoral constitution of the human being. And the, so health is defined as that balance, and illness is defined as the loss of that uh, balance. And then, of course, the, uh, the main one of the main premises is that uh, man's normal state uh, or man's natural constitution uh, is the state of uh, balance. Now, the historical span of Islamic uh, medicine coincides with the historical span of the Muslim community, uh, Ummah itself, which is now more than 14 uh, centuries. Then the history of Islamic medicine began with uh, Prophet Muhammad's teaching of the Quran, uh, which was revealed to him to his followers and, then, uh, and, and to the community, and this history continues until, until today. Now, while the, in the Muslim belief, while the verses of the Quran are still, were still uh, sent down to the Prophet, um, the impact of the Quran on the Muslim attitudes towards health, towards medicine, were already there, precisely because some of the verses uh, in the Quran uh, pertain to issues of uh, uh, medicine and, and health. For example, verses were revealed on the uh, dietary regulations. And then, of course, verses uh, with regard to food consumption, uh, the food quality, uh, the, the idea of uh, what in the Quran called tayyiban, the wholesome food, and the halal, uh, food, all these have implications for, uh, for, for health and, and, and hygiene. And, the, and then verses regarding the medicinal value of uh, natural, uh, natural products. And uh, in particular, honey was, uh, is, is mentioned um, in one verse. So that's what I mean uh, to say that the uh, the, the, the influence of the Quran on issues of health right from the time it was still, it, it was uh, being revealed, sent, uh, sent down. And of course, the, one of the names of the Quran, the Quran calls it, uh, itself uh, as shifa meaning the healing. Um, the, in, in Muslim 
belief about the Quran. The Quran is, is known to have many, many names, and one of the names is the healing, which of course related also to the divine, one of the many divine qualities, uh, God himself as the healer. Um, and then, of course, the surviving elements of the classical scientific Islamic medicine may be observed in several parts of the Islamic world, particularly the, the Indian subcontinent uh, known under the name of Yunani medicine. Uh, some of you may, not, may want to know Yunani, of course, uh, refers to the Greek. Uh, it's very interesting that Greek uh, medical tradition, which was uh, system, systematized by Ibn Sina, Abithena, uh, survived to this day. Uh, especially in, 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 in Pakistan, where they have their own very complete network uh, of the hospital, university, uh, pharmacy, all related to these uh, uh, traditional medical uh, products. And the Hamdat Institute is, uh, is the name of the institute, or the Hamdat uh, uh, Institution. Now, let me go to the next one. The scope of Islamic uh, medicine. Now, I'm using the word scientific here. Let me, uh, let me explain here because, um, of course, in conformity with what I explained earlier about the meaning of science and the meaning of uh, scientific. So in conformity, uh, what, what I mean by scientific is in conformity with the four structural elements uh, of, of, of science. Now, scientific Islamic medicine as a, uh, it, it was created as a synthesis of and successor to the ancient Greek, uh, Persian, Egyptian, and Indian scientific medical tradition. Uh, we have heard just now what the, the, the tradition of, the, of Greece and certainly both Hippocrates and, and Galen um, were very important figures in Islamic, uh, in Islamic uh, science. And the and, and here I, I mentioned several uh, sources of influence, uh, Greek, Persian, Egyptian, and Indian uh, scientific medical uh, tradition. So this has uh, something to do also with the, with the second point, the prophet's positive attitude towards scientific medicine in the case of Al-Harith ibn Kalada, Kalada, an important precedent for Islam's appreciation of scientific medicine. So, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad himself, in the sense that we have um, several streams, in sense, or two major streams. One is the, 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 the uh, sources of uh, knowledge about medicine from the Quran and from the Prophet. But the other one now is a scientific one which is foreign. Now I mentioned the name of Al-Harith ibn Qalada, who was a companion of the Prophet. He was a medical graduate of the uh, School of Medicine at Jundi Shapur in Persia. Some historians consider that as the, the best medical school at the time. Well, and, 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 and it's very unique, it's very interesting school, medical school, because uh, we have brain drains from, 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 from Athens, brain drains from, 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 uh, from India, and also from Rome, to, uh, to, and also from Alexandria. We have the, uh, the Alexandrian school. Uh, so this, People taught at uh, Junti Shapur. And uh, so Al Harib Nikalada uh, was, uh, he, he heard of the Prophet, he went to see the Prophet Muhammad, he converted uh, to Islam and became a companion and also became the, the medical doctor of the community. You know, for for many, uh, certain types of diseases, the Prophet referred to him as a kind of, as a consultant for the, for the, for the university, uh, for, for, the, for, for the community. But the important thing, hap uh, important thing happened, uh, the, the event was that when Jundi Shapur fell into the hands uh, of the Muslims, then the, um, uh, we have, for example, uh, the Christian uh, uh, doctor from the Bukhtishu family, because his family is really a medical family, uh, not only him but also his children uh, were medical doctors. So Harun al-Rashid, the caliph, for example, brought uh, a few of these uh, doctors from Judy Shapur uh, to Baghdad, and they, they, they started a new, uh, a new phase in the history of uh, Islamic uh, medicine. But the important thing is that because 
uh, for, for, for Muslims, anything that uh, was approved by the Prophet, for example, then would be, uh, would be followed, would be imitated by the, by the followers. So I think the appreci Islam's appreciation of scientific medicine uh, has its basis uh, in, in, in that, uh, the, uh, the, in, in the case of Hadith Ibn Qalada. The uh, medicine of the uh, prophet, uh, which of course is a very important uh, stream, is very important um, uh, tradition in Islam. Uh, this has been, in other words, this refers to the body of sayings of the prophet on issues of health, sickness, hygiene, and diets. Um, later on, this uh, became systematized. Uh, for example, we have the book of uh, Suyuti, uh, the complete um, collection of all the uh, sayings of the Prophet. It's called the Medicine of the Prophet, Tip and Nabi, or something referred to also uh, at Tip uh, and Nabawi. Now, part of the traditional curricula of scientific medical uh, education, um, for example, Ibn Sina or Avicenna, uh, has the view that uh, all those who want to become medical doctors, they must first be exposed to this medicine of the prophet. So you know, the medicine of the prophet became incorporated into the, medical, into the medical curriculum. And in the case of course, the, 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 the prophet's sayings and, and, and so on, um, not all were based on his uh, commentaries on the uh, Quranic verses dealing with medicine, but also uh, referring to the pre-Islamic, uh, what I call the jahiliya, the pre-Islamic uh, uh, folk uh, medicine, the folk medicine of the Arabs. Uh, some were approved, some not, uh, others not, but many were approved uh, by, the, by the Prophet and therefore they continued to be, uh, to be practiced. Uh, and the next thing is about the Prophet as a role model uh, influence on both a medical practitioner and the general uh, community. The Muslim belief that the uh, uh, the prophet uh, is the is the, the most perfect uh, creature, represents the perfect man, um, of which health uh, is an is, is a component, is a dimension. So in other words, here uh, he was also viewed as the person who has the perfect um, health in the sense of that his the balance which I was talking about earlier, of the different components of the human being uh, to be found in the perfect condition uh, in, his own, uh, in his own being. And then, of course, you have another uh, current here, uh, what I would call here spiritual medicine, um, which in the, I would say in certain parts of the Muslim world, and certainly in my part of the world, in Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on, uh, this um, uh, spiritual medicine the latest manifestation of it, um, everywhere, I mean, the, the centers are mushrooming uh, in that part of the world talking about spiritual uh, medicine, what I mean by that, um, the use of certain verses of the Quran to cure certain kinds of uh, diseases and, 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 and so on. Of course, this is not a new thing. It has been, been there uh, since, since the beginning, uh, but the, this thing is to be observed, I think, in different parts of the Muslim world. And of course, uh, by this also I'm referring to the Sufi tradition, the Sufi healing. Um, many of the Sufi masters, wherever they are, um, they tend to be the kind of the medicine, the, the medicine man of the, uh, of the community. Uh, people will go, many people will go uh, to consult them uh, to, uh, for various kinds of diseases. And finally, you have the, the folk and traditional indigenous medicine in its various uh, forms. Um, what I mean here, indigenous medicine is various forms. When Islam spread to different parts of the world, um, we also have the pre-Islamic, uh, the indigenous uh, uh, medicine, which continued to be, to be used. Um, again, um, I, was, I, 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 I can say, uh, this certainly about my own uh, part of the of, of the Islamic uh, world.
No, I go to the <coughs> religious and cultural context of Islamic medicine. Um, first, the significance of the Quran for religion and medicine in Islamic culture. I've already referred to earlier the Shifa, uh, the Quran as the as the healing as Shifa. I put the chapter, the uh, unfortunately there, I don't have the chapter there. Um, I'm referring to that verse. Um, for those of you who know this uh, Arabic, that verse in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas, qad ja'adkum ma'azatum min qad ja'adkum ma'azatum min rabdikum. Shifa'ul lima fis sudur. Wahudan wa rahmatulil alameen. Oh, you humankind has come to you a beautiful lesson and shifa on a healing for what is in the breast. Meaning that symbolizes what is uh, the, the, our heart and what is in our breast. Uh, so the, that verse refers to the name of the Quran as, uh, as, as shifa. Now, the Quran as a source of principles of medicine, um, in other words, here we are talking about general principles, not detail, in the sense that um, the Quran does contain verses that has been, uh, that has been presented as, uh, as, as providing uh, general principles, uh, including uh, psychosomatic medicine, that is the the, referring to the uh, psychological treatment, and um, of course later on Al Razi refers also to the uh, the role of uh, dreams. Uh, in other words, uh, because the science of dreams is accepted uh, in Islamic epistemology as a, as a as a authentic science, as a legitimate uh, science. Uh, one of the things of the Prophet is that true dreams constitutes uh, one fortieth uh, of um, of prophecy. Yeah. And then we have here the significance of the prophet for religion and medicine. I've already referred to that. Now the significance of the Sharia for religion and medicine. Um, first, the Sharia as a source of preventive medicine. I think the, it is one of the sayings of the, of the prophet Muhammad uh, regarding preventive medicine. I said, uh, preserve, preserve your health before illness comes. That's one of the, of, of the, of the prophetic uh, uh, hadith. So the idea of this uh, preservation of health, uh, what we call this uh, prophylaxis, and prophylaxis, the, uh, the, the importance of preventive medicine, um, and of course this preventive uh, medicine is not only uh, with regard to, uh, with regard to, so for example, uh, taking certain types uh, of food and so on, but also the uh, practices, religious practices, eh? the medical value of religious practices, especially, for example, fasting, which is regarded as having medicinal value, and then the dietary regulations, both preventive and therapeutic advantages. Um, this idea of therapy, ilmu ilaj. Uh, the importance of uh, diet therapy uh, in, in the case of some medicine. In other words, uh, taking certain types of food prevent illness, maintain our, our health. Certain other types of uh, food, um, they, are, they, they, they have this therapeutic value, the cure our diseases. And then, of course, the Sharia as a source of medical ethics. As for the varying cultural The varying cultural uh, context of Islamic medicine in different parts of the Islamic world, um, because of the, uh, what I mean here is that um, while the general principles of Islamic medicine are one and the same for all, uh, for, for all Muslims, but we do have variations um, of the uh, medical, of, of, of the practice as well as the um, users of Islamic medicine because of this. Uh, different cultural uh, context. For example, say, uh, we have different ethnic cultures. 
Dif different ethnic cultures have uh, different types uh, of food uh, preferences. And this, and because food, as I said, with regard to uh, diatotherapy, and therefore the, it varies, it's not the same, uh, depending from, um, uh, from region to region. And then the, the question of climatic and geographical uh, conditions. So this has uh, impact on the, uh, the use of pharma pharma uh, pharmacological products and um, apart from that, of course, uh, we have also other uh, practices related to public health, hygiene, and, and, and so on, which vary from place to place. I'll give you an example here. Um, this, uh, the midwife tradition, um, still in some, in some countries, traditional uh, societies, uh, not everybody goes to hospital or clinic uh, for delivery, for, 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 you know? so still the traditional uh, midwife. Uh, and a question, for example, their role is not only to deliver, but the question is what about post-delivery uh, treatment? So what is all in the traditional uh, 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 setting? They don't go and get the, the, the modern uh, medical uh, uh, products, but all using a traditional uh, herbals and, and, and so on. Uh, especially in Indonesia, I know very well, in Indonesia, not so much in Malaysia, in Indonesia, where this uh, kind of thing still flourish. Um, for, so the, the post-delivery treatment, for example, the, uh, the use of what I call this, uh, spices. Uh, products made from spices. How to uh, make the, uh, the, the new mother uh, healthy, and of course, there's also the aspect of beautification. Uh, how, because they're also interested in being beautiful after delivering, well, and uh, what is uh, available to them is that, as, as they say, they, they don't put un themselves under the knife. They, they, they I mean, they, they, they use these uh, uh, traditional products. Uh, medicine and the other sciences. Uh, medicine and the biological sciences. Now, in, in talking about the, uh, the uh, medicine and the other sciences in Islamic culture, um, one may be accused of just talking about a kind of speculation or just being theoretical, um, just being conceptual, uh, if not for the fact that there were many, many physicians in Islam who were also experts or how they, I mean, knowledgeable about many other are the sciences. So they provide a real practical example. They illustrate the case where medicine uh, was closely uh, connected to the other sciences. For example, medicine and the biological sciences. Uh, of course, in the Muslim classification of the sciences, medicine is put as a branch of natural philosophy because natural philosophy deals with bodies and medicine deals with the human body. So the, the important applications of botany and zoology to medicine, particularly pharmacology. And I certainly even, uh, re refer to Andalusia or Spain and the Islamic rule as one of the classical centers of achievement in, the, uh, in pharmacology, application of botany and zoology to, to medicine. And I just want to mention the name of Ibn Tufail because he was the author of the of the high, Ibn Yaqzan, the living son of the awake, uh, the one who inspired uh, Robinson Crusoe. Um, and he's and, and he just an example. And then we have the medicine and alchemy, um, well-known medical authorities, uh, who, both, who were both medical doctors and alchemists, uh, Al-Razi, uh, Muhammad Zakaria Al-Razi, uh, the ninth century, he was uh, well known as um, uh, in, in the field of uh, chemistry. He's considered as the uh, founder of modern chemistry, and um, uh, and of course the uh, Jabir ibn uh, ibn Hayyan. Um, the connection between medicine and alchemy, because there was an overlapping of interest in both the soul and the body. Alchemy also interested in that. Um, and alchemy is concerned with the idea of balance, mizan, which includes the issue of holistic health. 
uh, which I referred earlier, definition of health uh, in, a, in, a, in a holistic way. And then medicine and philosophical sciences. Medicine, uh, here I want to mention the names of uh, Ibn Sina, because Ibn Sina, medical doctor, and also philosopher, and also uh, Ibn Rush, Ibn Ross, uh, and then Kutubuddin Shirazi, 13th century Muslim scientist in Iran. Um, they all belong to the peripatetic school of uh, the, the Muslim peripatetic school of philosophers, and Ibn Tufail also belong to that school. And um, um, these people showed the connection between medicine and, and, and falsafa and philosophy. So in the case of, uh, well, uh, medicine as a source of symbolism for political science, the, the knowledge of medicine uh, was necessary also to the other disciplines like political science, where all the terms, uh, the, the knowledge about different uh, parts of the human body, for example, uh, were used uh, by philosophers, in the case of the political philosopher, to describe about the, the state of health, or state of wellness and illness of society, rather than the human body. Because the, the human society is regarded as another microcosm, as a, as a counterpart to the, uh, to, the human, to the human body. Even Al-Ghazali, in many of his works, used the symbolism from medicine uh, to describe about the, 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 the health uh, of our society, and for that reason, anatomy was a very popular branch of medicine among the theologians, among the jurists, uh, not just the medical doctors. Then, the connection between medicine and cosmology, uh, the idea uh, of the microcosm and the significance of uh, medicine, which I mentioned uh, uh, earlier. So here, the question of connection between uh, science of the cosmos and science of the microcosm. And finally, uh, interestingly, the same word, al-hakim, translated as the wise man. Al-hakim means the wise man. So Muslim medical doctors, right until now in, in some parts of the, of the Muslim world, uh, unfortunately not in, 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 not in Malaysia, they don't call hakim anymore, but uh, in some parts of the world, they still call hakim, meaning the wise man, uh, used for both philosopher and medical uh, doctor. And let me conclude with uh, the last part, the uh, medical education practice and profession. Uh, when we look at the question of medical education, uh, we find the, uh, the important role, the place and role given to the uh, both the Quran and prophetic uh, medicine, in other words, verses of the Quran dealing with, um, uh, with uh, issues of uh, health. And of course, I mentioned earlier the, 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 the book of the prophets, uh, medicine. Um, and then the medical ethics, uh, also taught as a part of the uh, curriculum. Uh, medical ethics as an integral component of medical curriculum. Now, let me um, be clear here, when we talk about medical ethics in Islam, uh, there are two interactive traditions of medical ethics, two parallel, but they, they, they do interact, influ they influence each other, those mutual influence. Uh, the two traditions of medical ethics, one is the, what I call this jurisprudential, the fiqh, fiqhia, the jurisprudential tradition, and there was medical ethics among uh, the juries, uh, because there is a close connection between the Sharia, between the Sharia or the divine law of Islam and the medical uh, practice. Um, they, they, in fact, there was a branch of Islamic jurisprudence dealing with uh, medical ethics, biomedical ethics. The and, and we have that the fiqh atib, they call this uh, medical jurisprudence, which was a classical uh, discipline. Not, of course, in the modern now, uh, we have different groups in the Islamic world today trying to uh, come up with a new jurisprudence that deals with uh, biomedical ethics, taking into account all the modern uh, contemporary state uh, of uh, knowledge of medicine and also uh, the use of uh, medical technology and so on. 
so that is now taking place, but not much progress has been made yet. But my point is that uh, there was once uh, an established tradition of uh, biomedical ethics among the jurists. Uh, and the other one, of course, among the, uh, the philosophical tradition, uh, because we know that in the classification of knowledge given by the many Muslim scholars, um, they have the category of sciences called the intellectual rational sciences, al uh, ulum al the the uh, the uh, that, that and uh, so among the branches of this group of uh, sciences. Uh, philosophy, economics, and ethics. So you have another, uh, an, 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 another, an, another stream and a tradition of ethics that is among the philosophers and the scientific community. Um, and it is interesting <laughs> that they have these two uh, together, just instead of one. Uh, but of course, as I said, they influence each other, uh, they criticize each other uh, about issues of, of, of ethics. And The place of philosophy in the general theory of medicine, uh, as Ibn Sina did, uh, there's a lot of philosophy there. The introduction to his uh, canon of medicine, the general introduction to the, to, to the book, um, it was a general theory of medicine, uh, theory and practice given there, and we know very well the place this book occupied in the uh, history of uh, medical uh, science, both in the West and in Islam. Uh, we know, for example, that this book uh, continued to be used as a text, medical textbook in the, uh, quite a number of Western universities until the 19th uh, century. And uh, uh, I know it has, it has been used by the uh, school of, by the homeopathic uh, tradition in Germany. Uh, even in Sina's uh, canon of medicine was uh, used as, as, as one of the texts. And uh, finally, the profession itself. The, 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 the profession itself, I just want to conclude with um, the, the standing or the, the, the appreciation, the valuation of the profession in Islamic culture. I would say that it is one of the most esteemed uh, professions in the sight of both religion and society. Medicine, first of all, regarded as a religious vocation of the first order. I quote here, religious vocation of the first order. Uh, this phrase was uh, used by the late Fazlur Rahman, who was a noted professor here at the University of Chicago. Um, and the second, of course, medicine is regarded as Ilmu fardu kifaya, fardu kifaya category of knowledge. Now, in Islam, we have two types, the fardu ayn and the fardu kifaya. Fardu ayn means that which is obligatory on every individual, that will guarantee his or her salvation in this world and in the next. But the other one is fardu kifaya, meaning obligatory on society as a whole, not obligatory on individual. But still, it is very, very important. Medicine is obligatory. If, if not enough doctors are available in that society, in that community, then the whole community is to bear the sin. So it's, 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 it's very important thing. Um, but looking at the situation of many Muslim societies today, Certainly, they are not honoring that. But I'm just saying, what's what the meaning of that knowledge? Or the, the meaning? So, medicine belongs to one of the Fardu Kifaya science. In fact, um, the Fardu Kifaya knowledge, which uh, already exists right from the time of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the Prophet. And medicine, of course, has a prestige in Islamic culture because it was linked to the prophets, not just the Prophet Muhammad, but also to the uh, the prophets of the of the old uh, of, the, of the testament, uh, and certainly, of course, it, the funding goes. It went back to the, what the, uh, the Muslims call uh, Idris, Prophet Idris, known as the uh, the Enoch, 
uh, and he was considered to have re to have been given that uh, uh, medical knowledge was revealed to him. Um, that's according to Islamic intellectual uh, tradition. Just also as he was given the knowledge of astronomy, and um, and finally, of course, the it is based because medicine is has its basis uh, in the Quran and, 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 and the Hadith. Um, and because of, of all this, the doctor is expected to be um, and, and, and in conformity with the title given, wise man, Hakim, uh, he's, he or she is expected to have virtuous uh, character, deep in faith, uh, this uh, trust in God. Uh, in other words, the kind of what the uh, Muslim uh, call the perfect, uh, the perfect man who embodies with himself this, uh, the various dimensions uh, of hikmah. Uh, the word hikmah means wisdom. Medical wisdom is just one of the many forms of wisdom uh, in the Quran, but it is an outstanding form of wisdom as far as Islamic culture is concerned. So thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. That was uh, uh, terrific. I guess over the afternoon so far, it looks like we started with a um, tired OBGYN from 20th century uh, United States to uh, traveled back to Hippocrates, um, uh, on to Ibn Sina, um, and we even heard that Ibn Sina took us into the 19th century Germany, which I didn't uh, didn't know until <laughs> uh, until just now. Um, so we've had a great, uh, I think, a great start. Um, there are two. Um, um, additional announcements. Um, we're, we're pretty good, I guess, at organizing the academic parts of it, but probably not as good as we could have been at organizing the worship part of it, which is new for us. Um, we um, would ask anybody who's um, interested in, um, uh, in Jewish prayers to uh, go to the registration desk to sign up so they can sort of get a head count there. Um, and then secondly, um, for any um, Muslims who are interested in uh, Juma on uh, uh, to, uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday, I guess, uh, would um, um, also check in at the uh, at the desk for uh, information about that. Um, secondly, uh, we didn't mention that there will be, for those um, who are interested, um, not simply specific um, faith-based uh, worship services uh, tomorrow morning, but there'll also be um, an interfaith uh, reflection um, um, at 7 a.m. using both uh, word and uh, music, um, and that'll be in uh, the Euron rooms uh, uh, B and C. Again, this is in your program, but just to make sure uh, we're uh, talking about um, um, everything that's available for, uh, for tomorrow. The uh, program um, now says that we have a, a break and we are absolutely exactly um, on time, which is an amazing credit to our uh, speakers to really have the discipline uh, to stay to their, uh, to their time. So um, we'll uh, have a break now. We'll reconvene at uh, 3.30 and we'll be back um, into the mid-20th century uh, for some things in the, uh, in the United States again. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.